Hi everybody, welcome to Mark's Backyard Birds. Doing a species profile today on a bird that you probably have heard and you may not have ever seen. Uh, it just depends on if you're an active uh, hiking type bird watcher or just a backyard bird watching person. Uh, the Great Crested Flycatcher. And it is a medium sized bird. And when you hear the name flycatcher, obviously it should conjure up in your mind what it does. And it, it and in ornithological terms, we call it aerial hawking. And a, a bird that sits on a limb like that and flies out and catches insects and comes back and lands on a limb. And there's lots of flycatchers. Uh, Eastern Phoebes are flycatchers, uh, Eastern Wood Peewees, and there's uh, many, many species of flycatchers in, in North America. This is one of the showier ones. Uh, it, it Flycatchers as a whole tend not to be real colorful. Uh, lots of browns and grays and uh, you know, tans and things like that. But the lemon yellow belly of the great crested flycatcher is an eye is eye popping when you see it, and uh, and of course they're like I said they're fairly large for a flycatcher, so oh bigger than a bigger than a robin, bigger than a cardinal, uh, but not not too much bigger, um, and they are in your woodlands. They're not an open prairie type bird. They are definitely a, a bird of the eastern mixed woodland forest, uh, and they can be. It can be hard to spot. Uh, one of the reasons why is uh, when they sing, and, they, and I'm going to play you their songs, they're very distinctive songs, but they tend to sit back and cover when they sing, which is kind of in contrast to when they're hunting. A lot of times when they're hunting, they're out on exposed limbs, but they don't vocalize very much when they're out in the open. They tend to wait to vocalize whenever they're in the cover. And they are, uh, like I said, I, they're, they're fairly common in the eastern two-thirds of the United States. Um, and if you live in that area, you may have heard this song. I'm going to play this song. And uh, there's two things about it. First, let you know, I use the Sibley app, uh, the Sibley bird app, uh, and it is uh, fantastic. And the bird calls within the app are from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And my, a couple of thoughts about my, when, when I hear and what I listen for, uh, for uh, the great crest of flycatchers in the spring when they arrive is first is the weep, real loud weep type of song, and I'll play it. And then the other part of it sounds to me a lot like a red-headed woodpecker call. So I'll point those out, but I'm going to play it here. Now, that first part, the weep, is, is very characteristic, and they do that a lot. That rattle there at the end, uh, to me, I, I, when I hear that, it's first in the spring. When I haven't heard it for a long time, I go, oh, and I have to think. You can separate that from a red-headed woodpecker versus the great crested flycatcher. So you, know, you, you learn that song, and you'll know that bird is in your area because you'll hear it in the woods around your house. If you have you know, mixed hardwoods and oaks, they they tend not to be deep into forest. They tend to stay up toward the edge and to uh, uh, we call edge territory. So where there's a little bit of opening, and then there's uh, woods. They they hunt along the edge where they get a lot of a lot of their insects from. And they not only eat insects, they also um, eat some fruit. And uh, they they'll especially small berries and, they, they, and fruit like that. They'll consume that, and they'll actually regurgitate the pit from inside of the berry. So they help distribute seeds for uh, the, the plant that they eat the berry on. But for the most part, they, they are true fly catchers and they're migrants. They do spend their winters down in the tropics and they come back in. They've been arriving here now for the last three weeks or so. Uh, we've been hearing them on our bird hikes at, and we see them. They're, they're, they're very entertaining birds to watch as they, they hunt and catch, catch their insects. Uh, another great thing about them and the reason I, I focus on them is, uh, as far as a backyard bird goes, is you can attract them to nest boxes. They are the only fly, uh, cavity nesting uh, flycatcher in the eastern U.S. Uh, this is a, a, an example of a, a cavity that this bird is coming out of, and that's a knot hole where a tree limb is broken off and created this hole, and, and the, the great crested flycatcher is making his nest there. Um, here's another great photo of of one 
getting ready to duck into a tree cavity, another place where a limb is broken off and it's the heartwood's been excavated. It may have been uh, uh, pulled out by woodpeckers or whatever, but the, the, and the great crested flycatchers will use this type of a hole. And some of the things that's really unique about their nesting, and I do want you to look at that rufous tail, because that is a really good field mark of them too. When you see them flying, quite often you see this reddish in the tail when they're flying their fan uh, and they land. So the yellow belly and the reddish in the tail are good field marks. But one of the unique things about their nesting cavities and their, their nests they build is they often weave snake skin into their nest. And this is especially true in the in the deep south where there's a lot more snake skin available to them. But uh, a, a, another favorite trick of, and I've seen this personally a, a multiple times, I've seen uh, them with a, a piece of snake skin draping out of their nest cavity. And again, the theories, of course, is that's to discourage other animals from entering, like a, maybe a flying squirrel or something from going in there uh, because they think there's a snake inside of it, which is really, really cool. And yes, uh, it, things like the black rat snake are great climbers and they do uh, go into cavities like that. So it, it's a pretty nifty uh, deterrent for would-be uh, nest visitors that they don't, the great crested flycatcher doesn't want in there. So yes, you can put up an artificial nest box. The I have seen them nesting in old bluebird houses that the hole has actually been widened a bit, like maybe a squirrel had chewed around the opening of it, or a woodpecker had pecked out that the, larger than that one and a half inch. Typically, great crests need about a one and three quarter inch hole, and they like their boxes a bit deeper, like nine inches inside. And so uh, this is one that's uh, they, my guy who makes our birdhouses here uh, for the store built a great crested flycatcher box. And you can place those out. They do like them higher than a lot of uh, the other boxes, but I, <laughs> I think the range that a Cornell says is three feet off the ground to 20 feet off the ground. Uh, so yes, they will nest lower. And I've seen them in bluebird boxes on six foot poles, or I've seen them on, in bluebird boxes on the side of an old power pole out in the field. Uh, so they will use use that. But again, safety, you know, the higher they are, I think they feel more secure. So if you can uh, mount a, a, a great crest of flycatcher box up a little higher, you may have more luck. And, um, and they recommend in the woods, but again, I have the, along the edges of woods is good for them. I definitely have seen them there. And it also, you know, it, uh, Cornell also says that you can actually hang the box. There's not a whole lot of birds that like hanging, uh, free, free swinging uh, nest boxes. So I would tend to uh, mount this on a tree. I think they'd be more appealing to them. But if you want to uh, try hanging it, it up 10 feet in the air or mounting it 10 feet up in the air, you might have some luck with it. So if you do live in the eastern two thirds, where's my, my cursor went away. Okay, here's the range map from Cornell. And you can see that they do, the, the orange is, of course, their nesting range. So all over the eastern two-thirds of the, the U.S. And then uh, the, the dark blue or the, the purplish blue color is their winter range. So they do winter down in, in South Florida, some of them, but in the Caribbean and, and down in lower uh, Central America, they that, that's where they more commonly winter. But you guys out west, don't fret because you do have a western counterpart to it. This is called the ash-throated flycatcher, and this is a, a, a bird of very dry country, uh, very similar uh, in in many ways. And they they also are cavity nesters. You can put up nest boxes out there. They don't have the bright lemon belly, the ash-throated, the ash color uh, being key, but they also have that kind of that raised crest, like the great crested does. And their range map looks like this. this. So they are definitely a bird of the western U.S., especially the southwestern U.S., and some overwinter spend all the year in, in, down in Arizona, New Mexico areas. Um, spend all you live there year round, but in other places they just nest in much of the states there. So yes, a great crested flycatcher and an asteroid flycatcher, very, very closely related. So you guys out West get the benefit, even though you don't have the great crested, you get to hear the asteroid and have them nesting in your yard too. So definitely worth, uh, a, a, you know, putting up a, a nest box for them if you can. They're very beneficial birds. They eat lots of insects. Uh, and of course, 
we're all about that. You know, we wanted to help the control. Uh, I've often said, if you just knew what our trees would look like if the birds weren't eating all the bugs that are eating the trees and plants of our area, it, it would be pretty sad. So uh, help them out. The great crested flycatcher, a terrific bird. Um, hope you have them in your backyard. Send on ideas for future programs, other species you want me to profile. Until next time, let's talk birds.